and then to and then today is this today is just the lecture or are you planning basically to... yes but okay. uh, basically yes but i have like some time at the end i think where i will start with the hands on so okay. that people also don't wait a long time to compile uh, tomorrow. okay okay so let uh, it's uh, 11 o'clock eastern so let's go ahead and get started so uh jan will uh uh start to uh uh, present the smash code and that will lead lead into the hands-on session so go ahead Jan. yeah yeah thanks thanks Juan. um yeah well, welcome everyone uh, to uh, the second lecture of, of today um which uh, will be about the smash transport approach um as you already saw on the timetable actually for the lecture part uh, i tried to Kept the, uh, keep it more a bit more general, so it will be a more general introduction into transport approaches in general and how they uh, will fit in fit into um, hybrid approaches and how um, both are used uh, which in, within the Jetscape framework, of course. Um, and to start, I think I want to be, start with a simple uh, picture, um, which I think nicely illustrates one of the themes that comes up in, in, in this lecture uh, uh, and also is um, used in Jetscape. And um, so what you can hear, see here is basically a, a fountain of water, sorry about that, a fountain of water um, shooting through uh, some dense fog. Um, I think this is a good picture because one uh, like um, intuitively can imagine that your dynamics within this, this water jet is quite different um, from the ones in the dense fog. And also therefore your theoretical physics description um, is most likely very different for, for, for both. Um, so you basically can separate your description of the hard uh, jets. And this is now basically a heavy iron terminology again from your soft uh, um, bulk part. In heavy ions, we use those two terms uh, mainly, um, or we separate those uh, terms hard and soft physics basically on the momentum of the particles that we want to describe, um, where high momentum particles concerns uh, hard physics. And this is, um, I mean, this is a rough guess basically. So, like particles above 10 GV are for sure very. Um, um, are hard physics particles basically where we apply perturbative QCD and jet physics and then um, below 5 GV or something um, similar we talk about soft or bulk physics uh, where you have low momentum particles and use theoretical description like statistics statistical thermal models or um, also hydrodynamics that we just heard about and the idea that what I want to basically want, uh, bring across is that we can separate our theoretical description for the different uh, regimes here and if you saw this picture already uh, um, on the first day um, about the Jetscape, um, uh, like a Jetscape flow diagram, basically, and this is this idea of separating the hard and the soft sectors is, is uh, directly um, uh, represented in Jetscape, where we have a common initial stage geometry, but then in the upper row, we have basically our hard sector, where we have our hard scattering and then the parton um, shower. Uh, and in the end, the jet harmonization. And on the bottom row, we have our soft sector, soft physics sector, where we have some initial soft density that is then used as the initial conditions for our viscous hydrodynamics. Um, and uh, in the end, we uh, use Cooper Fry basically to hardronize and then um, feed those hardrons into the hadronic uh, cascade as well. Um, <clears throat> and this last part, um, as you probably already guessed, is of course the topic of this lecture. And if we switch um, the um, the flow diagram to basically what we have as uh, different approaches in different modules, basically in Jetscape, um, you get this picture where, where you where we only go not go through everything again, but only to the ones that we will also use in the hands. So we have a trend to initial conditions. Then we use for the um, hydro part, we use music. Um, with the Cooper Fry sampling done by ISS, and um, uh, in the end, we will of course focus on the late stage stages with, with Smash. Okay, so talking talking about it a bit more 
um, about the approach for soft physics. Uh, so basically the state of the art for high energy collisions is to use um, so-called hybrid models where we have some, um, we have this picture here um, where you have non-equilibrium initial state dynamics uh, and uh, once we are close to agreement, we apply uh, relativistic hydrodynamics. Um, and later on, we switch to hadronic transport. And as we had some discussions already about the terms hardenization and particleization, and I actually also have both on the slide, let me, I mean, I mean, the end, it's just like a, a definition that you have to apply. I think I would basically say that hardenization happens still in the relativistic fluid um, as you have your as you have an equation of state in your hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic calculation that has a partonic phase and a hadronic phase. And in the end, when you switch to hadronic transport, you of course should be in the hadronic phase already. So the hadronization is actually happening inside your hydro still, where you then have degrees of freedom, um, hadronic degrees of freedom and particleization, I would call um, really switching from a macroscopic to, to a micros microscopic description um, via Cooper Fry. Um, and then with the microscopic description, we then have our transport. This is what we can evolve in, in our transport. Um, yeah, I will basically ignore the first part about the non equilibrium dynamics there, even though this has uh, um, interesting physics as well, of course, and just compare a bit like. The, the two later components in hybrid approaches where you have we have, we have some uh, relativistic hydrodynamics that, that Lipa nicely introduced um, that is based uh, on our conservation laws of energy momentum and um, some uh, different uh, currents. And we need to assume some local thermal equilibrium. Whereas on the um, hadron transport side, we basically, the, the foundation, the, the the fundamental equation is uh, the so-called Boltzmann equation. And we don't need to assume any um, equilibrium of our medium, so we can have a full non-equilibrium description. Um, we have microscopic, we, the, uh, hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic transport or transport in general is a microscopic description, whereas the hydrodynamics is a macroscopic description with the advantage being in hydrodynamics that you can have, have actually an equation of state because all your then it calls a phase transition because in your equation of state, basically you have all your um, uh, encoded, basically all your degrees of freedom that you have. Whereas in in transport approaches, it is quite challenging to uh, um, encode uh, or like model a phase transition, basically because normally you either have hadronic or partonic degrees of freedom. Um, and then, okay, the last point is pre pretty important because you have basic, we have different uh, applicability regimes. So in hydrodynamics, you need some high density. Actually, this is also what uh, Chun answered in the Slack on one, to one of the questions where you have your mean free path needs to be smaller than the system size. Whereas for, uh, for transport approaches, you need um, low density, so the loop system where the mean free path is, mean free, mean free path is large compared to the to the Compton wavelength. And those different regions of applicability make it, makes it basically necessary to um, combine both uh, into so-called hybrid approaches. But uh, let me just add one thing here that, I mean, there's also not completely separate approaches because if you actually, if you assume an equilibrium, if you assume an equilibrium or equilibrium distribution, you can actually, uh, get your ide ideal hydrodynamic equations from your Boltzmann equations. So no, not those are not deep, different theories, but more you can think of more of like different um, sides of the same coin. Okay, uh, with this, uh, I come to the picture that you should have in mind if you think about uh, transport approaches. Um, and this is actually uh, not a static, but a dynamic visualization um, that we did for, uh, with SMASH. And in this case, this is now coming back to not running a hybrid approach first, but just running a, a PP, uh, that lead collision, sorry, um, at 7.3 GeV with just the transport approach. And you can basically see that the idea is pretty simple of a transport approach. You have 
particles propagating. If they meet each other, they interact. Um, and if you have some resonance that is excited, uh, this uh, can decay into multiple particles. And you can see if you look closely, all of those things happening in this uh, um, in this movie here. But uh, okay, the idea is simple. Uh, you will see, even though I spared some details, that the devil is, of course, in all the details. But I think having this picture in mind is very helpful if you. Uh, Think about transport approaches. Okay, and with this, I uh, I would want to come. So, having this visualization in mind, I think it's good to talk about the theoretical foundation a bit more. Um, and as I already mentioned, uh, transport approaches are, are based on on the Boltzmann equations, where you see here basically you see here the non-relativistic version of this, um, and. The Boltzmann equation is uh, basically giving you the time evolution of the particle density distribution function, this f. And for a different, for each species that you know, each hadron species uh, in hadronic transfer that you have. And you can think of f uh, as the number of particles um, per phase space cell. So if you have your f um, and multiply this with your phase space uh, element, your cell basically. D3R, D3P, then you get your number of particles of for the for the species that you will look at um, in your cell. Um, the Boltzmann equation has different terms, so you have your time evolution, um, and then of course you, and then you have uh, three terms that are of specific interest. Uh, the first one is sometimes called the free streaming term. So this is basically just um, describing you. Uh, particles uh, uh, propagating along straight uh, lines according to your momentum, like according to their momentum. Um, then you have an uh, external force, or sometimes also called potential term. So if you have a potential for your particles, uh, and that leads to an external to a true force, uh, then your momentum changes. And on the right hand side, and this is probably the most important term in the equation, is the so called a collision integral. Um, and this I will. Uh, uh, go into more detail in the next slide. One word uh, about the applicability region or the, the, the limits. So uh, the Boltzmann equation neglects any quantum effects like interference, and you assume basically that your space and time span of your collisions is small compared to your mean free path. Um, okay, the collision integral, uh, you have uh, the collision integral basically encodes your change of the particle number in your phase space cell. So um, if you look at this picture here, um, you have two, two things that can happen. You, know, you can think of this that if in your, in your cell, you basically can have collisions that scatter your particles out of um, the cell. And this is uh, the negative contribution here, your loss term, the so-called loss term, or you can have particles scatter inside your um, phase space cell. So this is here depicted. Um, of course, those loss terms are then gain terms for, for neighboring cells. Um, and this, those two, the gain and the loss term make out, make out your, make, make out your um, collision integral. If one looks how this, or if one writes this down for two to two scatterings, one gets this integral here. Um, uh, and you can see basically uh, the, the minus sign uh, so shows that you have a loss term and the positive contribution uh, is the gain term. Um, I want to mention one thing here because you see here the, there's a cross section uh, in here. And this is actually, a, um, even though, I mean, in principle, you have a effective kinetic theory here. Um, here we can have some input from quantum field theory, so from first principles, because if you look at the definition of your, of your cross section, you can uh, see that the matrix elements appears here, and this can be calculated from first principles. So um, yeah, here we can have some input, which is, uh, of course, always a good thing. Similar as the equation of state, for example, is in, in hydrodynamics. Okay, so now we have now we've looked at the different parts. Then let's uh, let's solve the equation. Then right, uh, um, ideally, of course, analytically. The issue is that 
if we have a realistic scenario and we want to describe interactions between, well, if we want, if we have a realistic system, let's say in an AA collisions, we have like uh, more than 100 hard one species that are interacting. So you can think of your pions, rows, kaons, and so on, your nucleons, of course, deltas. This means that you need to solve the coupled systems of, I mean, sometimes Boltzmann equations are called integral differential equations because you have an integral on the right and a differential on the, on the left. So you need to solve this coupled systems uh, because you have collision terms for um, any interactions between your particles. So if you we here and look at this, like basically you have Boltzmann equations for all of your particle species and those are coupled because if you have interactions between your different particles, your, for example, your Fn F, uh, for nucleons is appearing also in your pion um, um, equation. So those are fully coupled and that makes it in general impossible to analytically solve um, this system of equations. Therefore, um, we need uh, uh, numeric Monte Carlo approaches where we have an effective description of the different uh, terms in the Boltzmann equations. Um, and this is, uh, and now I will go through uh, this, what this means. And I will first talk about the particle evolution. I put here the Boltzmann equation in this non relativistic form again. Um, so, first thing that we have to uh, account for is this free stream term. Um, and for this, we basically propagate uh, the particles uh, according to their momenta along straight lines. Uh, in this case, we assume that there are no potentials because otherwise we wouldn't have straight lines because the particles could be bent, right? Um, so this is uh, the first thing. And then it gets more complicated when you want to also look at collisions. Uh, so collisions should, of course, um, uh, happen when particles are close. And then you want to also perform, if you have like multiple collisions of a particle that are possible, you want to perform the, the, the earliest uh, reaction. Um, and this, of course, accounts then for the collision term. And here we have two different uh, criteria how we can decide when particles are close and also when to uh, when to um, perform those uh, reactions. The first one are is the geometric collision criterion, and this is well, um, so the so-called geometric collision criterion. And this is the one that is usually uh, the default in transport approaches. Um, what this means is you have your dt, which means transverse distance between your particles. And if this gets smaller than the square root of your cross section, your sigma divided by pi, then um, the particles uh, can interact or uh, interact. Um, and this is what this means is, or what this is, is basically a, a geometric interpretation of your, of your cross section. Um, unfortunately, this is limited to only binary collisions, um, as it's difficult to find a generalization of the, this uh, idea of transverse distance and also of um, uh, the time when particles act for, for more than two particles. Um, particles, uh, the time that when such a reaction is happening is the time of closest approach. Um, however, here we have a bit of an issue with. Um, uh, with the sorting that we want to do to perform basically the earliest reactions, because this can sometimes depend on, on the frame that we look in. So this is basically some an issue with uh, the Lorentz invariance uh, of your criterion. Um, and there's also, the, but there are some improvements if you, for example, um, look at the Kodama criterion that I will not go into more detail here, but I just want to mention that it's not always a, a big issue. The other um, class basically of collision criterions are stochastic ones where you have a collision probability for your particles in the same phase space cell. And this collision probability is Lorentz invariant. So this um, helps already with, uh, with one of the problems. And this allows you also to um, um, uh, treat multiple particle interactions because it's easy or more or less straightforward to extend this collision criterion to um, multiple particles. Um, however, here you have some, um, here also, I mean, it's not perfect. You uh, have some dependence on the choice of your phase space cells that you look at. So um, th that one has to be also a bit careful. Okay, um, 
And the last term that we want, that I want to talk about is this external force term, or speaking about the treatment of potentials. And if you involve uh, paired potentials, then um, you basically have to uh, separate two kinds of approaches. Um, uh, in uh, transport approaches. So we have BUU and QMD approaches. Those are equivalent if you don't have any potentials in your calculations. If you include one, then um, this is, uh, they, they treat it differently. One is, so BUU stands for Boltzmann Uhling Uhlenbeck approaches. Um, here you have your um, F, your distribution function represented by test particles. What this means is so, you can think of, you have in space and time, right? You have your, um, for, for example, your distribution function of pions. And of course, in a regular collision, um, you don't, so what you do is you evolve uh, with like single particles, but you want to still represent or sample basically your F. Um, and to represent this F, you use multiple test particles that are basically delta functions that uh, give you those, uh, this distribution function. Um, and uh, this means you enlarge basically your number of particles by this number of test particles, uh, but in, at the same time to not alt alter the dynamics of your, of your system, you divide the cross section by the same factor. So the um, basically the reaction likelihood is, is uh, the same in after all. Um, in BU approaches, the, you have a mean field potential that is only density dependent and therefore you are, um, the momenta basically change to this classical equation. And here, because the BU approaches um, can, uh, you can actually show that the BU approaches solve the Boltzmann equations if you have a limit of n test towards infinity. Um, uh, of course, in numerical approaches, it's, it's good enough if you test, uh, you have a large number of test particles and you test if, if this changes your result. Okay, on the other hand, we have QMD approaches, quantum molecular dynamic approaches where your particles are um, Gaussian wave package. So you don't have any test particles and the potentials are the sum of your pairwise potentials. Um, here we solve a many body Hamiltonian basically. So we don't have, this is not derived directly. So uh, from you know, the Boltzmann equations, uh, uh, equation, um, so not based on an equation for, for your dense distribution function. Um, however, of course, one can still show that one gets uh, close uh, to the Boltzmann equation um, uh, um, solution. Or one, one, one basically can show that one solves the Boltzmann equation in cases, but uh, just the theory is not based directly on that. Okay. Coming back to the more practical side, um, and the application of your, so, so when do we apply transport approaches? Um, one can generally say that this can be applied to uh, non-equilibrium systems of microscopic particles. Um, and we have uh, two regimes where we have well-established approaches that are roughly split at um, uh, um, incident and uh, beam energy of 20 GeV. Um, so for high energies, we basically have hybrid approaches that are also done in Jetscape um, as the soft sector, as I showed. So we have a non-equilibrium uh, initial evolution, as I showed, we have viscous hydronomies and hydronic rescattering. Um, at low energies here, um, shown in the red box, we have uh, the standard uh, approach at low energies is uh, basically having only hydronic transfer approach, which ha have, has resonance dynamics and nuclear potential, so the pure transport evolution. In addition, um, I just want to mention that there are also approaches that include uh, partonic degrees of freedom and uh, as well as hydronic degrees of freedom. And uh, those, of course, are able to cover uh, the full uh, um, energy range. Examples here are AMPT and PHSD, for example. Um, maybe you heard them before. Um, then you can also study neutrino collisions, actually, with uh, approaches like uh, EBU. Um, and transfer approaches can also be used to look at air, show, air showers from cosmic waves, um, which is what was done with UAKMD and also SMASH in some instances. So interesting different field uh, compared to heavy ion collisions. 
Um, so, talking quickly about the history of hydronic transport approaches, they are basically successfully applied for, for decades, really, because if you look here at this uh, um, graph from Steffen Bass, you have the first one, first ancestors of the transport approaches at, uh, from the 1980s, um, and uh, really like a large number of them. SMASH fits into this uh, historical chain as the first C++ code, um, which was written from scratch, basically, with the idea to take the most successful aspects of existing approaches, most uh, um, aspects were taken from European B and Eastern BU. And the goal is to provide a hard hydronic system with, with vacuum properties. That's uh, the main goal. Okay. Coming to this more specifics of, of SMASH. Uh, um, SMASH is uh, short for simulating many accelerated strongly interacting hadrons. As I shown you, it's a, it's a newer hadronic transfer approach uh, for the dilute non equilibrium stages uh, of heavy ion collisions, so late stages in, in hybrid approaches. And um, you can also apply it for low energy collisions. Um, you have a Smashes could be called basically a BU type approach since it also uses this um, described test partic particle method. The default is the geometric collision criterion, as, uh, um, um, as I talked about. This is basically taken from UQD, for example. Um, a, a recent addition. Uh, it's basically the stochastic collision criterion that we also introduced that now can describe multi-particle interactions, which is, by the way, the topic that I worked on my PhD. Um, and may maybe I also take the opportunity to advertise that we, with the newest release in Smash 2.2, we basically finished our um, implementation of HEPMC3 um, and uh, also uh, root output. Uh, which might be interesting to the experimental colleagues that are participating in the school. And uh, uh, let me also say that uh, Smash is uh, open source. Uh, I think as all uh, approaches in, in, in Jetscape are, and um, you can download it on uh, GitHub. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so we have different uh, initial conditions in Smash um, that can be described. Uh, Mainly, we, oh, we basically have four, and I have visualizations put here for everything, for all of them. So, if you look in the upper left hand corner, you see a low energy collision. Um, where you, have, you can have either elementary collisions or also nucleus nucleus collisions. Here now it's a gold gold collision at uh, 1.23 AGV. Then on the right top, we have uh, a box calculation where you have a box with parallel boundary conditions, meaning that if a hard one exits on one side, it uh, enters on the other side, basically uh, like simulating infinite matter uh, conditions, uh, which is uh, in particular practical if you want to look at equilibration of hadronic um, systems. Um, and if you want to look at the hadronic system that runs out of equilibrium, you can look at a sphere that has uh, is initialized with momentum and basically just uh, freely expanding into, into the surroundings. And then <clears throat> it's the most relevant for, for the school here is the list modus, where basically you can feed in particles, um, hadronic particles into smash, um, use it as an afterburner for, for hydrodynamics. <clears throat> and in this visualization, you actually see um, not only the particles uh, from your transport approach, but also the hydro phase uh, um, uh, simultaneously. And you nicely see basic, you see that the um, particleization process where um, the hydrodynamic stage feeds into the um, transport stage. Um, yeah, and this is, of course, this is what is uh, done in, in Jetscape as well. And uh, also this uh, interfacing, as Philippe already mentioned, is uh, all taken care of by the framework nicely. Okay, uh, so 
the degrees of freedom, so the, the hadrons that are uh, um, in SMASH uh, are listed here. This is uh, the state of SMASH 1.7, but it's very similar in the current version. You can always look at, as we will see also later in the hands-on in this particles TXT file, where basically where everything is listed. And you can also, in principle, freely change the content if you want only, for example, a very limited system. Um, the if you see a pion, we also have the isos, the multiplets, of course, of those, and also the anti uh, particles uh, for all particles, and then for the meson, for the meson baryon, for the properties of the different particles, we we, we look, take them um, from the particle data group uh, booklet. Um, what is mentioned here very small is that uh, that I will I will not talk about this today, but we also have the opportunity to. Uh, um, describe photon and uh, dielectron production um, in a perturbative uh, way. Okay, um, uh, in the for for lower energy collisions, it's very important. Uh, your resonance description is very important. So, for example, if you think of a, a, like two nucleons uh, hitting each other with some uh, with enough energy, then you can excite one of the nucleons to uh, to a delta uh, n star or some other baryonic resonances. And um, those so uh, unstable particles uh, in SMASH uh, have relativistic bright weakness spectral functions that you can see at the top. Um, and uh, particles are only stable if their uh, width is below 10 keV. So the pion, eters, and kaons are stable particles. Um, and for the decay width, we use this treatment of Manley et al. Um, that is similar, or is basically what is also done in recent BU. And you can see that this leads to uh, this structure here of your decay width. So um, you have a cutoff or a threshold at the, the mass of the lightest decay products. But if you increase your mass, more and more decays are possible for, in this case, this N star 1440 resonance. And so there's a question on Slack uh, from David. Yeah. Uh, so is this so so the question was is it so straightforward with two to two cross section for hadrons or uh, is there in uh, some guessing involved um so yeah this of course depends on the on the on the i, I will actually in the um later slides uh, i will show some um, results uh, for the cross sections what we we really do try to if there's data we try to take it into account um, uh, for example for proton proton or some uh, or like very common processes this is of course very well constrained and we can compare there and um, use this as input uh, for higher um, or for, for different like more exotic particles this of course gets difficult because this is not measured and one takes, uh, yeah, one there one uh, takes some guessing, or it takes some guessing to to look there. But the main, um, the most abundant cross sections, of course, are well constrained by data. Yeah, for example, one thing that one does is uh, um, the so-called uh, AQM uh, approach, where one basically scales with the um, quarks that one has inside the hadrons. Uh, the cross section. Um, yeah, I think this uh, addresses the question for for now. Um, I'm happy to discuss this also later on after the lecture uh, further. Okay, um, coming to the interactions that we have in Smash, and this question nicely uh, goes uh, into this topic uh, or leads into this topic. So basically, again, talking what we do uh, as the um, um, modeling for the collision term. So we have uh, five different types of interactions. We have inelastic scatterings. We have elastic scatterings. Um, uh, we have decays. And also the inverse is um, basically described by detail balance, where you have um, two to one processes that form a resonance again. And in the few GUV energy regimes, so you have a uh, couple of GV only um, in your uh, scatterings, you basically have your hadron cross section dominated by this um, process of decaying and exciting different resonances. However, for higher energy scatterings, one has to um, uh, 
uh, take different uh, take a different approach, and this is called or we call basically string fragmentation. Um, not only we, but this is a common common term, of course. Um, but we use uh, we use string fragmentation, and uh, I want to want want to take uh, this uh, um, uh, slide also to introduce this shortly. So string fragmentation is for basic, especially used for high energy um, uh, hard on hard on collisions. So high energy here meaning like above three to four GeV. And the uh, idea where this comes from is or uh, yeah, the idea where this comes from is, this is based on uh, in the confinement, uh, where to remind you, we have a color fl flux tube. If you have, for example, here a meson and you try to separate this meson, you, it, this builds up a color flux tube. And at some point, the energy here is high enough that um, the new quark, uh, anti quark pair uh, can be created. Uh, and if you pull the string basically a bit longer than this actually happens. And instead of having two different quarks, you have two mesons. Uh, and this idea is now applied. If you have a, a, a high energetic hadron hadron uh, reaction, you take uh, a quark and an antiquark or a quark or a quark and a quark, diquark pair from your two hadrons that collide. And those basically form the string. And this string then fragments into different hadrons. So here you can see the picture that illustrates this idea. So you have your initial QQ bar pair, and here's basically a string um, in between. And at some point, the energy is high enough that you can create more Q, um, QQ bar pairs, uh, and here again, and so on. And in the end, you basically have uh, you combine those different quarks again into your um, um, mesons and baryons. Um, so your hard ones. And then smash, um, we use the well-established ap approach, basically, it's called Pythia, um, to perform those uh, hard scatterings and uh, this string fragmentation that gives us um, the hard, uh, basically the high energy part of our hard on hard and collision cross section. And this is what I already talked about. Um, so the element in the elementary, um, uh, so for the cross sections, uh, we look at elementary reactions, of course, first. Here you see the total cross section for proton proton and proton um, pi minus. And here you see the mentioned data that there's a lot of experimental data. Um, and of course, those, um, those uh, elementary cross sections, as we, for example, also in nuclear nuclear, nuclear collisions model. Um, uh, the uh, collision by microscopic um, NN collisions, those elementary cross sections are one of the major constraints of transport approaches. And you see here the different contributions at different energies, and it's particular nicely in this proton pi minus cross section where you see a lot of those resonance peaks uh, in the lower energies. And then if you transition to higher energies, then you see, you see the contribution from your strings. And you also see that uh, those very fundamental um, uh, cross sections are well described, and we try to um, uh, basically, if there's data, uh, we try to constrain our uh, approach to do this as well for other um, more exotic processes. Um, and then I want to end basically with uh, three results um, that are, I think, quite illustrative. Of the for smash, um, one is a very nice one because I, I mentioned that you normally uh, have no analytic solution of the Boltzmann equation, so you also cannot uh, really compare, of course, your uh, numerical solution. But there are some very few cases where you actually have an analytic solution of the Boltzmann equation, and one is if you um, have a expanding um, um, a metric, and you can see here. That we, uh, if we compare over time our um, uh, particle density and our, and our energy density um, of the analytic solution with smash, we see basically we see very nice agreement. The same is true for if we compare the really the distribution function. So this really this gives some confidence that our um, collision term is uh, correctly or our collision algorithm is correctly implemented. Second results is just to show that the pion production for collisions at low energies were also, which is a good concern that our dynamics is correctly described, um, 
here we compare to some data from um, of, uh, like an old experiment 4P or a new experiment as hardest that measure in this low energy regime. And again, we see uh, here a nice agreement with experiment, experimental data for, for pions at low energies. And I think it's appropriate to close with a result from, from Jetscape actually, um, where we come, where SMASH is compared to a UAQMD afterburner stage. Uh, um, as mentioned, UAQMD is a well-established approach that came a bit before SMASH. And we see here that for the different bike observables, we can uh, also see a rather good agreement between um, the two approaches. Um, and I uh, basically want to close just to put this here. Um, if you want to have want to find out more information on Smash, um, we have a, a website as the main entry point. As I mentioned, we are on GitHub. The user you can find the user guide and the documentation that is more extensive online. Uh, we also have a so-called analysis suite where we post some for each version um, some very basic. Uh, results um, and that is uh, showed uh, um, quite a few visualizations that we have done. Um, you can also click here on the link to see even more of them and uh, also learn basically we have a tutorial how to uh, how you can produce your own. And with this I thank you for your attention and also thank you to everyone involved in the school's organization uh, organization. I think it's really nice. Um, uh, yeah, nice school. Nice. Yeah, thank you. And maybe okay. one more thing I will, I will post on uh, Slack some uh, quick feedback that you after the lecture so you can just click on uh, different things uh, to collect some, some uh, feedback on the on how, how you like the lecture and if you learned anything. Thank you. Okay, thank And with, yeah, I think with, with this, we, I think we can start with some questions and um, then transition to the hands on. Yeah. Okay, so any. We're finished. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Jan. Any, any questions? Uh, either, since we're at the end, either, either raise a hand uh, uh, to ask or, uh, or type into Slack. I don't see any at the moment. Yeah, I think, I think you, I, oh, we have one. Well, it's not a question, well, a comment. Go. Probably a oh, comment, no. yeah. Um, uh, can you comment maybe about the randomness of the two to two cross sections? Because I think there's also some randomness in choosing the final particles uh, directions, like directions of momenta, if I remember correctly, like it's not entirely deterministic, is it? Mm. Or I'm wrong. Uh, so I'm not so sure what you uh, what this question is aimed at. So, uh, of course, I mean what we uh, so for the the it depends on uh, on the on the particles that scatter. In some cases, they have like some angular momentum, um, mm -hmm. and of course, we sample uh, um, so uh, we sample the final momenta as, as as this is a Monte Carlo approach. So you basically for each um, Scattering, you sample them. Of course, so you have some deter like some deterministic outcome of your for your final particles. And uh, if you sample this a lot of times, then in the end you sample your um, angular distribution. Um, and for those where, for example, we have um, like non-isotropic um, uh, angular distributions for uh, for some nucleon nucleon uh, for the nucleon nucleon scattering, I think. Um, if there's nothing known about the angular distribution, then we use the isotropic uh, distribution as a first approximation. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any any other questions or comments? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Do you, do you want to proceed to get started on the 
hands-on session. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so similar as LeapPy basically uh, did, I think it makes sense to start the hands-on today to um, uh, save a bit time where you just wait for compilation and running of, uh, of uh, Jetscape. Um, so I think I would start with the hands-on session uh, with that here. And um, the first thing that you should do is uh, open the uh, Summer School 2022 GitHub repository um, on, on, in your browser and click on the uh, transport section. Um, I, there's also the direct link, but you can probably not click it. So you have to find it in your browser yourself. The idea that in the end you end up in this uh, on the readme um, of the transport um, section so that we can follow together um, the first uh, section basically where we have we want to learn and how uh, learn how to run smash with a jet cap as a hydronic afterburner uh, the other two goals for the session that we will tackle tomorrow is basically understanding the smash in, in, in inputs and outputs and then also learn how the um, afterburner affects the event particle spectra. Okay, um, and then with this, I will change my screen share. Um, I thank Hendrik for posting it in the chat. Uh, I, will, uh, I will change the screen share to um, the terminal. Let me give me one second. So close the lecture. So you should be able to see my terminal, right? And the hands-on on the right, am I correct? Okay, I guess so if, if not, uh, you, can, um, you can let me know. Yeah, okay, I see one hand. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Um, maybe as a pre so one note in, uh, in advance. So it, I don't know if this is it applies to everyone that participates in, in the sense on, but we noticed that there's probably some bug in, uh, in the JetScript uh, desktop Docker at the moment that makes the calculation on Apple M1 machines. So one of the newer laptops in Apple very slow. Um, normally, I mean, we are a bit puzzled by this yet. We don't understand this fully, but uh, the thing is that, uh, I mean, normally on M1 Max, Smash and also Jetscape is very fast. So there's probably something going on here um, with the client itself. Uh, if you are, if you have such a laptop, then please let me know, then we can um, do something about it uh, for the uh, session tomorrow. I basically can send you the output files or something because what you will notice that it will be very, very slow. Um, yeah, that just as a heads up uh, for, for people um, if they have such a machine. But let's start with the uh, compile and run of Jetscape um, with Smash. So it's uh, again, as uh, Lipa also did, I just wanted to check that we all start from the same page. Um, so if you go to your uh, Jetscape Docker, folder, um, you should basically see in your LS uh, that you have your Jetscape, you have your stubs, and you have your summer school directory. So you clone all of them. Um, and as you probably have done for the previous uh, hands-on start by Lipa, you should also, if you look into your um, Jetscape at external packages, you should have your ISS and your music um, basically downloaded via this getter scripts. Um, and in addition, also already now, you should um, go to the summer school 2020 and pull, mast, uh, pull main again, just to make sure that you have the most, the current version, which I will also now do. And I mean, for me, it was already up to date now. So this is basically what is what you should have is probably this correct for everyone. So please, if you have this setup, um, 
put a check mark, a, a, a green check mark, and if you don't have it, uh, then go ahead and uh, fix it if you uh, and put a red cross, but that we wait for you. So I see check marks or yeah, I guess so. I wait a bit that any everyone has time to check basically. Okay, and the red cross. So if so, anyone has it basically. Uh, I guess from from the Slack reactions uh, from the Zoom reactions. Sorry. Okay, so I don't see any red crosses. That's good. Um, then we can start. Uh, you can do this basically. So you follow the readme now. The first step. It's also written here is that we create a new Docker container called JS Smash. And for this, you just copy this and um, execute. Oh, that's good that I also didn't run into this. So you first have to start your Docker, of course. And then you will be able to run basically and start this new um, this new Docker container. So it takes some time for Docker to, to start always. So if you, you can already go ahead, basically, if you had your Docker daemon already running, then you can um, change directory into the external packages and run dot get smash, which is the getter script for smash. But in this case, it not only downloads it, but it also um, uh, compiles the, it as a shared library. So you can go, go already ahead and, and do this. Okay, my Jack, my Docker is up. And I created a new container. It should be uh, it should be already downloaded for you, um, the base container, so uh, the base image basically. So it should be very fast. And now follow. Go to external packages and now I do the get smash. And this will now take, depending on your machine, a couple of minutes. Uh, for me, it was usually like around four minutes. So maybe if you come to the step that smash, uh, that you see similar output here that smash. Uh, Builds the, um, the shared library um, and you run the get smash, you can also put a green tick now that we know that we're all on the same page. So uh, please put a green tick if Smash is compiling basically. Okay, we have a red X. You can comment in the chat what is the problem. We have some compilations. Okay, we have we have two two issues, two people with yeah. issues. Yeah. Do do you want them to yeah. put their yeah, issues please. in the Slack? Yeah, either or. Okay, could not be that too. Um. So, Joel, are you in the in the Docker? So did you run your Docker file in new Docker? Is this the, so that is interesting.
Yeah, so uh, to be honest, I don't. So why? So it looks like you couldn't cannot create a new directory um, in your within your smash directory, which is a bit funny. So I'd, I think Joao, could, could you post this also in the Slack that we can uh, get kind of that I can get back to that. Yeah, for, for these things, it's, it's easier to work in Slack because then uh, you can continue yeah. to get help after the after the. Yeah, session. that's exactly it. Yeah, the, the similar things. Uh, I also see another one that uh, we can address. Yeah, another time. question here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it, yeah, I will. I will come back to this. Uh, I mean, the session is not anywhere ending soon, so. Uh, I can I can get back to you on Slack on that. I can try to help. So um, why am I while the uh, Smash uh, compilation is is uh, running um, is building. Let me just mention that the next step is basically, and this is would be good if you start this uh, today, basically, um, and let it run. I mean, by doing a lunch break or something, it will not take long, only like 12 minutes or something. We can. So the idea is to rebuild uh, Jetscape, but this time um, with Smash as well. So we will have here, as you see, we have music, we have ISS, and we will also use Smash on. For this, you will, after Smash finishes, go to the Jetscape um, directory. Um, if there's no build, you will make one, and then you configure uh, Jetscape with Smash music and ISS on, and then you run your four cores or whatever you give a uh, Jets, uh, given Docker. And uh, yeah, and then this let runs until after the session, which is. Uh, which is already good for tomorrow. Okay, I will do that now. So I go to Jetscape directory. I make a build folder. I change into it and then I just copy what is here. Run the setup and um, I think this will fit nicely as the end of the session then make uh, and this will run, just run for the next 15 minutes or something. Okay, thank, thanks, Jan. I think I think we'll both both co-chairs uh, are going to need to leave promptly at at noon. So I think what we'll do is is close the session uh, here. Uh, but if mm -hmm. you as as you're watching the compile, put any issues you're having into the Slack channel. Yeah, that is very, would be very good. So um, yeah, I, I, I will watch the Slack and come back to that. And and that way for for the next lecture, <clears throat> everyone should be should be set up. So yeah, exactly. That that's ready for for tomorrow. You are then set up and uh, ready to run Jetscap with with Smash together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a good place to to stop. Okay. So thank thanks again, Jan. That was a great lecture. Uh, and, and a good start on the hands-on. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so we'll see you all, <clears throat> excuse me, I think tomorrow it continues. Yeah, 28th uh, at 9, 9 a.m. Uh, for uh, continuation of these, both of these topics. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.